Wednesday, September 17, 2014, and this is KBIA's Views of the News. I'm Amy Simons, and here with me are Missouri School of Journalism colleagues Mike McKean and Ernest Perry. We're here in the Futures Lab studio down in the Reynolds Journalism Institute to talk to you about what's making news and the stories behind those headlines. During the next half hour, we'll be talking about a project the Missourian took on to fact-check that Mizzou-made football commercial. We'll talk about a Memphis reporter who wanted to add some context to what many originally saw as a blooper on live TV and why a woman's rant, complete with curse words, suddenly made perfect sense. And we'll talk about the pressure the media is putting on several NFL sponsors to reconsider whether they're putting their advert or where they're putting their advertising dollars. But that's not all. Let's start with today's discussion about the continued violence against journalists and workers at the hands of the Islamic State. As promised, the militant group released another video this past weekend claiming it had also now beheaded British aid worker Brian Haynes. At the same time that news was breaking, a series of stories all claiming to be exclusive with the parents of James Foley and Steve Sotloff. The theme of those stories was pretty much all the same. Claims that the United States government did little to support the families during their son's time in captivity, and in some cases possibly threatened them with arrest if they met the ransom demands on their own. Here's Jim Foley's mother, Diane, with CNN's Anderson Cooper. We were, um, you know, asked to not go to the media, to just trust that it would be taken care of. Um, we were told we could not raise ransom, that it was illegal, we might be prosecuted. Um, we you were, were told, told you would actually be prosecuted? Yes, if you that was a ransom. real possibility, told that many times. We were told that our government would not um, exchange prisoners, um, would not do a military action. Um, so we were just told to trust that um, he would be freed somehow, miraculously. And he wasn't, was he? Your reactions to that clip? Well, I mean, first of all, you you have to feel deeply for these families. If you were in their shoes, you, you would feel exactly the same way. And from the stories that have been reported, there is some question, at least of the level of tact, at the very least, that was used in communicating with them, what kind of information the government was willing to share with them. On the other hand, I do have to say, and it is a legitimate story, mm -hmm. But I have to say, we still come back to that question we've been talking about for a few weeks now. Is the U.S. and British policy about paying no ransoms for hostages a legitimate policy? And that still should be part of this conversation, too. I mean, you can make a case for it because the European governments that did get those individuals freed by paying ransoms have contributed to the financing of these terrorist organizations. And as our government at least argues, and you can make the argument, it can encourage more kidnappings if you're going to pay ransom. So I think that's an important question that we need to keep talking about. However, there is one issue that I think the families make that really is legitimate. I mean, not only did they discourage them from raising ransom and say it's illegal and it doesn't fit U.S. government policy. They also said there will be no prisoner exchanges. When we just did that with Bo Bergdahl, the, the, the sergeant who was released after, what, how many, five people from Guantanamo that we had uh, were, were released from the, Tal the Taliban people? So that was a change in U.S. policy that was okay for a soldier, but it's not okay for an American citizen. And I think that's one of the things that at least the administration is saying that that's the difference, is that we're talking about a, a soldier, uh, and there, he was being treated as a prisoner of war in this circumstance, which was one of the rationales that they used for having the prisoner exchange. That wasn't necessarily the case when it came down to the journalists. So I think that th I'm not saying that that's a legitimate uh, argument right. to put out there, but at least that's what they're saying. And in terms of the policy uh, that the British and the Americans have, uh, that's a long-standing policy, mm -hmm. and they've actually come out and said that over and over. When you look at the other nations involved, France, Italy, uh, uh, Switzerland, I think uh, was another one uh, that has, has, has uh, uh, paid the ransom, uh, they're basically saying that we're going to do whatever we need to do in order to protect our citizens. But the problem with that is, is as you said, Mike, they're actually financing uh, the, 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 the operations 
of these terrorist organizations. And the only thing I, you know, when you talk about the government saying that Bergdahl was a prisoner of war, so that's a difference. Well, in the war on terror are American citizens who are not soldiers who are being used as hostages. Are they not also prisoners of war? A family could certainly, other people could make that argument. Uh, it, it just bothers me. And the other thing that kind of bothers me a little bit uh, from the New York Times story, at least, that got into great detail about how the family was treated. The European hostages, yes, their governments allowed or helped ransoms be paid, but they also intervened very directly in helping to scan and very and mon on. monitor the emails. And some, in some instances, according to the Times, the government took over the responses of the emails from the families to make sure that the right message was being, you know, being portrayed. The American families were on their own, it sounds like, if you take yeah, their account. It. That was one of the things that I did want to bring up is that I, I think that the American government and maybe the British government could learn something from the way in which these other nations responded and still maintain their policy. Right. If you get involved early enough, then you can have a little bit more control or and have also have a little bit more of an understanding of what the what the families are going through because they you're right they felt like they were left out on their own to deal with this and they were hamstrung by the policy that's set up by by the American and British governments. And just out of fairness, I think we should say, regardless of the criticisms of how the administration may have treated the families, the Obama administration did launch a rescue attempt. Many special operations forces went into harm's way to try to release to not only the Americans, this. but everybody else. It just didn't work out. So one of the other issues we've brought up as it related to this is that Sotloff and Foley both were... Uh, freelance journalists, that they didn't necessarily have the power of a big name news organization supporting the work that they were there doing. Well, one of the New York Times, uh, Times's Iraq-based reporters was on CNN this weekend talking about how his situation covering the Islamic State is different. Since you're home visiting your folks, have you talked to them about the security risks that you face? Not yet. I just got here, and uh, I'm sure it might come up uh, around the dinner table in the next few days. But uh, so far, I've tried to keep it uh, keep it light. <laughs> I mean, I, I hate to even try to talk about these these issues, but if you were to be kidnapped, if you were to be detained, even briefly by one of these opposition groups, what would you want your family to do? Would you want them to be speaking out in public? Would you want them to be uh, keeping quiet the way Saltloff's family did? Have you have you thought about that before? I haven't thought about that specific question, but um, you know, I think it would probably be more in the hands of the New York Times than uh, you know than my family. And I and I would defer to the experts. I honestly don't know what is better to whether to keep it quiet or to uh, you know or to go public. So one of the things we were talking about right before we started today's show and before we went on was how does a government, how does anybody go and tell a parent what to do in that situation when their child has been kidnapped? Equally difficult, how does a child prepare their parents in a situation like this and what we just saw there for the possibility it could happen? Well, I would hope that uh, the New York Times, being the, the, the international organization that it is, would have some protocols on how they're going to deal with the situation. And I th I'm pretty sure, or at least I would hope, that he, as since he's back, would sit down with his family and say, here's the protocols that the New York Times are going to follow. Here's the people that they're going to be working with in government, if he's at liberty to talk about those things. Which was kind of one of those things in the clip and in that interview that I saw. Like, all cre uh, credit to Brian Stelter for asking the question, but if I'm Tim Marengo, I don't know that I'm going to actually answer it on national TV. Well, and I have to say, from previous examples, major news organizations have tended to follow the be quiet, follow what the government is saying until such time as you can say something else. I wonder if one consequence of this story showing how Sotloff's family and Foley's family were so displeased with the way they were treated that other families, regardless of what the journalists may tell them, may have a different response in the future. Oh, you're absolutely right, but I, I, I would want to think that when you're talking about a major news organization like, like the New York Times or, or the Wall Street Journal or someone like that, they would have had some sort of communication with the government. They would have some some lines of, 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 of communication going that's different from when you're a freelancer right. and you're working for an organization that may not have the stature of, say, a New York Times, a Wall Street Journal, or NBC if you're News working or something on like spec that. and don't have anybody backing your work until it, after it's done. Exactly.
But I mean, the Global Post, which was uh, this online uh, news organization that was supporting Foley, I mean, they were involved with the family. And according to that New York Times story, they were helping to try to raise money. So I don't know that the distinction is quite as bright as we might think it is. Okay, well, since we last sat around this table talking about the Ray Rice suspension, so much has happened. The TV networks have publicly announced a plan to stop running the graphic elevator surveillance video. A number of other players have been deactivated, and in the case of the Vikings, Adrian Peterson reactivated and then overnight put on a special commissioner's list. Uh, and then there have been other domestic abuse cases as well that have been under investigation. There has also been a renewed call for the corporations that sponsor the NFL and its franchises to pull their advertising dollars. Here's MSNBC's Micah Brzezinski. You both talked about the dollars and the money that Roger Goodell makes and the NFL makes. Well, where do they make the money from? Where's the money coming from? Sponsors, right? Right. Isn't that how that works? Yeah. And have any sponsors pulled out? Where's Gatorade? Where's uh, where all these big big names that flash the stadiums and make all the commercials? Where are they on this? Because right. you know we're sitting here uh, condemning the NFL, rightfully so, yeah. for their stupidity, boneheadedness, and tone deafness, and support for v domestic violence. But these sponsors are in the same boat. Well, They're yeah. paying for it. They're paying to watch football and then the side effects of it, domestic violence, play out, and they're making money off. One of those sponsors not mentioned by name is CoverGirl. The cosmetics company has quite the PR problem. It's developed a campaign that runs in each NFL city customized for that market with a woman wearing eyeshadow in its team colors. The tagline on that campaign is get your game face on. That's backfired, see, because people have photoshopped the Ravens-specific ad, and the woman's left eye also appears to be badly bruised. Um, we've now seen that Anheuser-Busch has come out and said it's uncomfortable with some of these things. We've seen Radisson at least suspend its sponsorship of the Minnesota Vikings because of what's been going on with Adrian Peterson. Your reaction to this? Well, I think basically what's happening is that the whole situation is being tried in the court of public opinion. And the NFL is losing badly, mainly because of the decisions that were made by Roger Goodell in the Ray Rice situation. And then uh, what's going on with Adrian Peterson, which is in the courts right now, and the team itself is dealing with that situation. And the NFL is allowing the team to handle that. But the entire league is, 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 is being impacted by it. And now all of a sudden you're starting to see the boycotts or the call for boycotts and companies pulling back. So it's going to continue to happen until there's some sort of a, a resolution to it. Uh, but don't know when that's going to happen because now, or I think over the weekend, uh, Ray Rice is, is basically saying he's going to appeal and that the indefinite yesterday. suspension. The, the uh, players' union has gone ahead and filed that appeal on his behalf. So it's 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 going to continue, but now it's starting. It, it may affect the pocketbook of the NFL. I mean, I hate to be so deeply cynical about this. I mean, I think we be sh cynical. We That's shouldn't, what we do yeah. here. We shouldn't <laughs> underestimate the power of that video. I mean, that really was a, a, a level, a degree of difference in terms of how people are processing this whole story. And it is true, you mentioned Anheuser-Busch, McDonald's, Visa, Campbell's Soup, General Motors, FedEx, a lot of these big sponsors have all put out some sort of statement of concern or reprimand or we're monitoring the situation or whatever. But if you just look at the hardcore economics of this, I think the NFL and the sponsors believe they can ride it out. I mean, you just look at their TV ratings for Sunday Night Football after the Ray Rice story came out, and they did a piece about it during that broadcast. The ratings were up, I believe they said 8% from last year, and overall the NFL's ratings are up in this first week basically since that video came out. If you look at the amount of money, that people sp spend on sponsorships, more than a billion dollars a year these sponsors pay just for sponsorships, not for the advertising or the promotional campaigns, just to be recognized as a sponsor. You could how much money the TV networks are getting out of their deals. And there was one uh, 
economist who was quoted as saying, basically, it's like an aircraft carrier hitting a mine. It blows a small hole in the hull, but the ship's not going to sink, and they can keep sailing while they do the repairs. And I think that's what the NFL no, think thinks is right. going to happen. I think you're absolutely right. I think that what they're hoping for is if they can get further into the season and people begin to talk about the games and what's happening on it's the field, then it's going to start bit. to blow over because you're you're going to get into the playoffs, you're going to get to the Super Bowl, and then all of, all of this is going to be be talked about from a historical perspective as opposed to what's going on right now. And Mike is absolutely right. This is all about the money, and NFL right now is – the number one brand when it comes to sports. I mean, it's it's it tops Major League Baseball, it tops the NBA, it tops everything else that's out there. I mean, it is a major entertainment tool. And so because of that, I mean, even if these companies like Anheuser-Busch and McDonald's are serious in threatening to pull back some advertising, as some executives are saying, other advertisers are just waiting in line to take their place if they pull out their advertising. So I don't know that the boycott's going to have that much of an impact with regard to changing the NFL's behavior. And then part of it is that it's the it's the Baltimore Ravens, it's mm-hmm. the Minnesota Vikings, it's not my team. So if people are going to be supporting their team no matter what, and they're looking at it from that perspective, and I'm pretty sure the advertisers are looking at it that way too. Yes, we can talk about those teams that we may be talking about the NFL as a whole as, uh, right now, but as long as people focus on their team and their team starts winning, then the NFL will be able to ride this out. Okay, well, speaking of advertising and football, I'd like to give a pat on the back to our colleagues at the Missourian for a piece it ran in advance of Saturday's game against University of Central Florida. It's about the Mizzou made commercial. You know, this one? Since 2007, Mizzou football is the only BCS football program ranked in the top five in academic performance and top five in NFL first round draft picks, top 10 in total wins, and the only program that can make those claims. I call that remarkable. We call it Mizzou made. The Missourian calls it, their words, not necessarily true. The paper fact-checked the commercial, just like a political ad, and found that maybe the numbers don't exactly line up with the truth. Uh, misidentifying Missouri's national standing in categories related to academic performance and the number of first-round draft picks. So exactly how far off is the ad from being truthy? Well, I would say when it comes to the first-round draft picks, uh, they, are a little, they are far off on that one because if you start looking at – just some of the other teams within the SEC mm-hmm. in terms of their draft picks, the, the University of Missouri is, is is low on that list. So I think that's that's problematic. And then when you start looking at the academic rates, they are pretty, pretty, pretty good in, in that regard. But I don't know if it meets the number that they were talking about. I think it's something that they aspire to. But you also have to remember is that when you're doing an ad like this for 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 any kind of athletic program, be it professional, college, uh, whatever, you're going to skirt it in a way that's going to make you look a, a little bit better, if not a lot better, than what you actually are. And that was kind of what the athletic department's reaction was to this when questioned by the Missourian. No? Well, and that's uh, that's one of the strange things about the story to me is that the only quote that they were able to run from anybody was from Chad Moeller, who's basically saying the spokesman for the, the spokesman for the athlete, athletic, which is basically, department. well, this is this kind of came from numbers that we use for promotions. They may not be 100 percent. OK, that's all we know. I mean, I do think the Missourian, I laud them for doing the story. I think it's a, a nice little version of kind of a low level uh, data journalism kind of piece. Um, they showed the graphs. I mean, they made their case. But nobody's really quoted about, you know, why did this happen? And so if they asked questions, they didn't show what the responses were. And then this isn't the Missourians' fault, but I do find it kind of interesting. It was their number one online story for Mm -hmm. that week. And yet there were no comments from any readers on their website, as far as I could find, on their Facebook page, on their Twitter page. Why is nobody interested in talking about that story? See, one of the reasons I think that might have, that that one of the contributors to that could be, and this is entirely speculation on my part, I first saw this Friday evening, that it became something that people shared within circles and within their own social networks, but I don't think that the comments came through in any formal uh, Missourian channel that at least we were able to find 
because the audience wasn't necessarily there and engaging on that level. They're, they're talking amongst their friends, though not necessarily amongst other Missourian readers. Yeah, that, that may be the case. Friday night, yeah. Saturday being game yeah. day, yeah, different but, mode. No, I, I agree with you. But, I mean, the other thing is is that, and getting back to Mike's point mm-hmm. about not getting some answers from, from the athletic department, I mean, could they have been using some other – some other numbers? Could they have been going from another list? Uh, there are tons of lists out there, and I, I, and I can say this because I'm, I'm uh, just uh, to be transparent, mm-hmm. I'm a member of the Intercollegiate Athletic Committee. And there are tons of lists in which they get graduation rates and, and, and all of these figures that they probably use in the promotion that may be different from what the Missourian analyzed. But if that's the case, then then the athletic department should have said that, or at least they should or have been cited asked. the source of what that list was. We see that exactly. with rankings all the we, time, we it, all the with time. our own school, with other parts right, of the university. Right. And- it, it is an interesting issue about what. how does a story become buzzworthy or not? Because in some ways you'd have thought that story would, but no other media that I saw picked, picked it up. up on it. You know, so it was kind of a Missourian exclusive. The Missourian's audience all by itself is relatively small, but I just wonder why it didn't become and buzzworthy. Part of me wonders, if it was about that dropping it on Friday night and that it's just not part of people's normal online consumption patterns and that it just fell into an off part of the traffic pattern. It's become a bit of an inside joke with the three of us. How many of the issues we end up talking about on this program come down to one thing and one thing alone, context, and so often how context is missing. Well, I want to talk about something that happened in Memphis. It's about a reporter who realized there may be more to what his station's viewers saw on TV, and he went back to ask more questions. It started when WMC-TV's Jerrica Phillips was reporting live during a flash flood. I know many families do not want to leave, but they are asking folks in this area to evacuate. Uh, I have someone here who wants to talk. since 2003, and this the five times this... All right. Well, we, we obviously there are some angry uh, residents here in this area. In the days that followed, that video went viral, and everyone was poking fun at the station, at that woman for dropping the f bomb on live TV. But reporter Nick Kenny wanted to show who she was, what her story was. So he went back and found 51-year-old Priscilla Lester. Um, He talked to her and did that without a camera, without lights, without a live truck. The two just had a conversation. He wanted just to know her story. They talked and they even took this photo that you can see right now if you're watching us on television or online. Um, I want to ask you guys what you think about this. It's it's a very different situation and I invite all of our our, our audience to, to come to the KBIA.org links blog and, and read it and see just how heartfelt it really is. I thought it was a very good story to go back and, and, and find out, you know, exactly what her story is. And and the reporter went out there just to have a sit down and that's You don't see that very often. Mm -hmm. We go in, we get a story, we move on to the next story. Well, and and in this one, it was one of those things where once it once it went out there, went viral. You know, people were putting it up on their Facebook pages. It was being passed along through YouTube and that sort of thing. Just the part that made her crazy woman has a tantrum about a flood. Exactly. And and but he said, wait a minute, there's more to this. And he went back out there and he got the context of the story. What I'm hoping is that that part of the story will also go viral. I'm not holding my breath I'm that that's going to happen. My either. But but I think it will. But it also I think it really should speak to reporters about when you're out there covering situations like this, people are desperate and they're upset. And there are certain things that they're going to say, certain things that they're going to do that does not does not define them. That is not who they are. And we need to maybe take a step back and say, wait a minute, maybe we shouldn't do this live because this could, could, could send the wrong message about a person, about a neighborhood, about what actually is going on. And in Lester's case, her, flo- or her home had flooded several times in the past, massive damage, and with this 
storm in particular coming in, she was just so frustrated and so overwhelmed that all she really wanted the station to do was some real reporting on why the city infrastructure is such that every time it rains, she has to bleach her home. Well, and I hope they do that. I mean, and I have some hope that they will do that because of the way that they treated her in this story. Lots of times the, the, they would just moved right on to the next story. We'd have never heard anything more about her except this incessant loop, this little, you know, the five second Vine video or whatever of the okay. crazy woman going off and dropping the F-bomb. I mean, she had real problems. They realized that they needed to do something to humanize this person and to describe her problem. Now will they take the next step right. and actually follow up with the stories about why does a neighborhood flood five times the next number of years? Is there something about the people who live in that neighborhood and their economic circumstances or their racial circumstances or whatever that leads the city to not do the right thing? I mean, actually, if you go and read that story and you go and read the comments, mm -hmm. what, you're gonna, what you're gonna find or what you're gonna see is that you have people from all over the area talking about the infrastructure problems and the fact that you have a city and a county government that's not really paying attention to what's happening with the infrastructure in terms of flooding, in terms of sewers, in terms of the electrical grid. There are a whole host of problems that come out, and those issues are coming out because they went back and did this story. Yeah. That's what I think that gets to the point that you're talking about, Mike. Okay. So this next topic is another one about showing genuine emotion on a TV news broadcast. Dave Benton is one of the main anchors at WCIA, the CBS station in Champaign, Illinois. Recently, his doctors shared some sad news with him that he wanted to share with his audience. I told you a few weeks ago that my brain cancer is back. What I have learned in the next uh, last few days, in fact, as I have seen doctors several times, I'm learning more about what my future holds. Basically, my cancer is back and it's too big for surgery and radiation. Um, doctors have told me that I may have four to six months to live. Now, I've also decided to try a new treatment. It's an antibody treatment and a chemo treatment to slow down its growth. Uh, the goal here is to have a few more days and to make them the best that they can be in the life that I have. Benton is being called brave for the way he's shared this information with his audience and his decision to keep working. Uh, this isn't the first time we've talked about news personalities making their struggles with different illnesses, specifically cancer very public and, and sharing those on the air. But to me, this one feels very different. You know, uh, he was brave. And one thing that I really liked about his approach to it, I mean, knowing what he and his family are going through, but he tried to turn the focus back on other people in the audience with similar predicaments. He kept saying, this isn't about me. Mm -hmm. And he kept talking. About, here's another thing I thought was really interesting. He came on the air and said, oh, by the way, I'm a born-again Christian. A reporter who wrote about the story in the local newspaper said he was blessed. I mean, you hear some language that was coming out in the coverage of the story because of the market that you probably would not have heard in some larger cities. I mean, the, the thing I liked about it was that when he came out to talk about it, he talked about the fact that he, what he's going to do with the, with the time that he has left not so much dwelling on his situation, but on, I'm gonna spend time with my family. I'm gonna spend time with my friends. I'm gonna spend time trying to help others who may be in a similar situation. That is something that I think is, is, is very important, and, but also sends a larger message to others who are in that uh, in a similar situation. And just one other quick point. Mm -hmm. I mean, this story went all around the world. You had Chicago media, Hollywood media, Christian media, British media, all covering it. I wonder, though, why the local public radio station and the local student newspaper in Urbana, Illinois, have not covered this story yet. Maybe we'll find out more about that in the next coming weeks. I'd like to thank those of you at home for taking time to join us this week. Uh, it's been a great half hour. We invite you to read more about the topics we've talked about today on our links blog. You can find that under the Programs tab at kbia.org. Like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at Views on KBIA. These are all great ways to watch and listen to our program again. Leave us comments and questions. See previews of what we'll be talking about next time and more. Our thanks to RJI's Travis McMillan for directing today's show. To Kyle Felling for handling the audio. Hope Kerwin and Josie Herrera are our associate producers. I'm Amy Simons, and we'll see you next time.